retina irritants or eyesores. They're plaguing cities and neighborhoods across the country. My mission, to stop the spread of this epidemic and to neutralize the problem at all costs. I know this may seem a little extreme, but trust me, you'll thank me for it later. Let's just say, this is my way of paying it forward. vacant lots, abandoned side yards. We've all seen these kinds of eyesores, and wouldn't it be beautiful to see some native flowers blooming there, perhaps? Well, these are seed bombs. These are a fun way to introduce new vegetation into empty lots or, or beds that need planting. You see, back in the 1930s, these seed bombs were used uh, to restore areas that had been burned by forest fires. Planes would fly over with these bombs full of seed, and restoration of the native flora would begin. These are really simple to make. Let me show you. You'll need a bowl, some air dry clay, which you can find in an art supply or health food store, some compost, and of course, seeds. Think about the type of area you're planning to plant. For shady spots, choose a woodland mix. For sunny places, go for meadow type flowers, poppies, larkspur, cosmos. You see what I mean? and I'm going to put these together in the ratio of five handfuls of peat-free compost to one handful of seeds to three handfuls of clay. What you want to do is you want to mix the compost and the seeds together thoroughly in a bowl and then mix in the clay. You may need to add a little water so it's wet enough for all of this to stick together, but you don't want it to become a sludgy mess. It should have the consistency of biscuit dough. Make sure the seeds are surrounded by the clay and compost so the bombs can slowly be broken down by the sun and rain to release the seeds. I found that shaping the mixture into truffle-sized balls fits beautifully in an egg carton. Once you've made the seed bombs, let them dry in a warm, dry space, and then they'll need to sit for at least three to four hours. Overnight is ideal. Now, if you want to save the seed bombs for a while, keep them in a cool, dark place, and not for more than a few weeks. Now, once these dry, it's bombs away. And you see, I like to time my strikes when there is a chance of rain, because once you throw them and they land and it rains, depending on what type of seed you use, you can see growth within 10 to 12 days, maybe two weeks, and blooms, well, in six to eight weeks. Pretty good deal, huh? It's a fun project for kids, and it's a great way to restore some of those not so beautiful areas in some of our neighborhoods. Give it a try. Still to come on Garden Style, preserving the past to protect the future. A pear preserve, great for gifting. Plus, I'll highlight a few organizations doing their part to pay it forward. I don't know about you, but the effect beauty has on me is astounding. It really affects the way I feel. It makes me feel better. Take these beautiful tulips, for instance. When I put this blend together, I used four different types of tulips to create this effect. The idea was for it to make you feel cheerful and happy. And I hope by looking at them that you feel the same way. It's amazing what a little yellow, a little salmon, a little pink, can do to create a beautiful composition and change our mood and attitude about the world we live in. So I got with the city of Little Rock, my hometown, and I said, why don't we plant a lot of tulips? Let's fill containers with them. So we filled up 80 plus, and we planted them in beds like this. The idea was to make the city more beautiful and the people happier.
Gosh, it's amazing. You've gotten a lot accomplished. <laughs> Thank you. I started with this, this ugly old van, uh, just taking supplies out to, to homeless, unsheltered homeless. And so the more we got out there and the more we started meeting people and, and seeing the way that they were living and, and the way that they were, you know, getting their food and things like that, uh, it, it just it became very apparent that there had to be a better way for people who are struggling to have some decent food to eat. Right. And so we started this with the intention of, of giving them that opportunity, you know, and also, you know, the dignity that comes with that. Right. So not only do, do these people have an opportunity to have nutritious food that's locally grown, uh, beautifully grown, but also they have an opportunity to participate in the growing and, and which I think to your point helps self-esteem. Every year I always look forward to the blooming of my irises. Just look at these, aren't they gorgeous? They're big, beautiful, robust blooms and stately appearance in the garden. Well, they're just fantastic. And the aroma, I love to cut them as fresh flowers. The key to making them last longer is all about water absorption. Cut the stems at an angle to create maximum surface area for absorption and then put them directly into water after cutting. Just as they occur in large groupings in nature, I like to do the same in my flower arranging, keeping the same variety and grouping them in a vase or a pitcher like this. And it's interesting that the iris was the personification of the rainbow in Greek mythology, and I can see why. They're available in a full spectrum of colors, so you're sure to find one that best suits your decor. Now, as much as I love creating arrangements for my own home, I love sharing what I grow in my garden with friends. Big show I go. Hey, oh, Joyce, I brought you some flowers. Oh, they're so sweet. Yeah, I hope Come you on. enjoy them. I will, they're beautiful. Come on in and get some tea. Love it. My name is Don Smith. I'm a member of the Over the Hill Gang, and uh, almost all of our people are retired from a lot of different walks of life. We come out here on Tuesdays and Thursdays to build houses for Habitat for Humanity, and primarily we're a framing crew. I turned 87 last December. Oldest one in the bunch. There are a great, great bunch of people over here. They to watch out for me. Well, first it's fun, so people want to come out and volunteer with us because it's a good time. How is this going to impact your life, having this house here in this neighborhood? This is a dream come true for me. I'm a single mother. I've had some struggles in my life, and I really am not in a position to buy a, a new home. Right. Um, this has been such a blessing for me. My kid's going to have her own backyard. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to have things that we haven't had before. And just to be able to live life like a normal human being again it will be so amazing. My friend Vicki, who's a news anchor on Soul of the South, loves to cook and so do I. And anytime I can pick up something at the local market, like these delicious fresh pears, well, we like to put them to work and also pay them forward in a fun way. Come on, let's get started. Vicki! So Vicki, this recipe calls for about how many pears? I like to get about six to seven pounds mm -hmm. of, of pears. Good, I overdid it. <laughs> yeah, we can eat those later. <laughs> I know. I like being an over overachiever. Now that'll produce what? It looks like you've got about a dozen jars there, a yes. dozen pints. Uh -huh. Okay, good. So, so you know, the recipe is really pretty straightforward. You know, after you have cut your fruit, like like we've done, yeah. I like to put the fruit in the stock pot and then I add a cup of sugar per pound. All right, as we discussed. And a little bit of lemon juice 
and just a touch of water, maybe about a quarter cup. Sure, you don't want to dilute the flavor right. too much. Because the fruit will have its own mm -hmm. juice and the Boy, sugar. Boy, these pears yes, certainly they are so they nice and fragrant and juicy. So you don't need a lot of liquid. They will produce their own. And then you let them cook down, simmer until the pears are really tender. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. Right. Once the pear's tender, it's ready to pull it off of the stove and mm -hmm. start putting them in jars. Put them in your jars. Batch number one. Yes, they smell so oh, good. Hey, and we have a few really little good. chunks in there, which will be good. Yeah, I like that. So now it's time to get these in those jars. Okay, you Let's, ready? Now you've sterilized the jars. Yes, they're and, sterilized. And, and your scupper there. Yeah. yeah, that's a mighty handy little thing there. Okay, let me start. All right, please. I'm going to pull them around here on okay. this side. There we go. All right. Oh, look at that. Mm -hmm. This is the moment Gorgeous. we love to see. And I just take it right up to the bottom of the blue Look at that. funnel. There's one. And I'll hand that Wonderful. back to you. Wonderful, we'll thank little, you. We'll get a little process yeah. going here. And it looks like it's taking about a ladle and a half. Let's get Can a spoon and try Let's... them, yeah. Mm-hmm. Look at those pears in there. You can see those beautiful chunks. One for you. Okay. For you. Oh, thank you. I'll let it cool off because it's really hot. Oh, it smells so good. Mm. Oh, wow, those are good. I, I love them. On ice cream, um, vanilla mm -hmm. ice cream with a ginger snap. Oh my gosh, that is delicious. Killer, killer. This is really good. You know, the beauty of this recipe is it works for any type of pear. We're using Bartlett today. Yeah, and they worked perfectly. And the next step would be to get these all tightened down and get them in the hot water bath. Yes, we have to make sure. Yep, and um, keep them in there for about 10, 10 or 15 minutes. 10 to 15 yeah. minutes. Yeah, I feel good. safe with 15. Now you're such a big gift giver. What are you going to do to sort of decorate these up? Oh, we have, have some great wonderful, style. thank you. We have mm. great burlap, and then we're going to tie the burlap on top and it has a little orange thread running Ooh, through it yeah. and we'll tie it with some rope and, and of course the Vicky signature of course. <laughs> <laughs> I love it it's so much fun cooking with you oh thank you I have had a blast this is a wonderful day I'm so glad you stopped by with those pears you bet. come do by it again anytime soon. yes Katie's Crops is a nonprofit, and what we do is we have vegetable gardens, we grow the crops, we harvest them, and then we donate them here locally to soup kitchens and those in needs, and we also host a monthly Katie's Crops dinner, where the meal is based on what is harvested from the gardens that week. We have a goal of 500 gardens in all 50 states within the next five years. If somebody has an idea to create a garden, a food garden, where they can help people who are hungry, they can submit an application to Katie's Crops and then you all sort of help them out. Yes, we have grant cycles open. We have grant cycles once a year and we receive applications from kids ages 9 to 16 across the United States and they tell us about how they want to start a garden and we pick as many as we possibly can and you start your own Katie's Crops garden. Well, it's a wonderful idea and it's very inspiring. Thank Keep you. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Sometimes paying it forward starts with protecting and preserving the past for future generations. In Newport, Rhode Island, the Preservation Society of Newport County is doing just that. I joined Chief Executive Trudy Cox on the lawn of the Elms Mansion as she explained their mission. Trudy, when did the, the Preservation Society begin their work here in Newport? The Preservation Society started in 1945, so next year we will be celebrating our 70th anniversary. Really? Just right after the Second World War? That's right. There was a rumor around town that 
1748 colonial house on the waterfront of Newport, Hunter House, was going to be dismantled and it was going to be taken to the Met. And all of these Newporters said, it's going to that's stay our here. asset, we're not going to let it go. <laughs> then in the early 1960s, we learned that this house was going to be torn down and it was going to make way for a shopping mall. Oh my word. And so the same women who helped start the Preservation Society in the 1940s stepped forward and put up $10,000 a piece and for $100,000 they bought the Elms. <laughs> my goodness. And it was up and running as a historic house museum in several weeks. We have 11 historic houses that are open to the public. And 11 I think now. that is what is so unique about the Preservation Society is that it spans 250 years of architectural history. Mm. So if you. There's some very early houses right. and buildings here in Newport, right. I've noticed. Newport has the largest collection of colonial buildings of any community in mm. America. There's something here for everyone. There is. And it's all within walking distance. And then the coup de grace is that we own green animals, which is. What a uh, fun place. One of the largest topiary gardens in America, and it was founded more than 100 years ago. Anyone who's been there knows that you can see giraffes and bears and sailing ships and all sorts of well, tremendous. You, well, you can't go there without, well, being dazzled and amused. Right. So Trudy, how are these houses different than other house museums someone might visit? I think the biggest difference is that these houses were actually lived in, worked in, played in, there were dances. Some historic house museums are manufactured. These, when you walk into them, and I think you agree, you can feel the remnants oh, and the yeah. memories and the spirit of the people who um, spent time. Particularly those that ha you've been able to bring a lot of the furnishings back in. Right, there are so many stories to tell. There's the story of how these houses were built and because they are massive. I mean, consider the fact that the Breakers was built in 18 months. It's almost unbelievable. Well, it is. It's staggering. What a colossal place. And then a house like the Elms in its height had 40 people working, 20 people in the garden, 20 people on the inside. That's bigger than our gardening staff mm. today. Mm. What is really the unique thing about the Preservation Society is the authenticity. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I hope you've been inspired to give of yourself to others. It really makes me feel good. And you know, the writer Malcolm Bain, I think said it best when he said, you know, if you wait around to do everything for everybody rather than something for someone, well, you're probably not gonna do anything for anybody. So get out there and do something and have fun doing it. For Garden Style, I'm Alan Smith. Alan, this is Hold great. On. We need to say that we're going to get him back. Wow. Mm. Y'all just don't know. These are really pretty good. Am I wrong? I'm telling you. I want to rub them in my hair. This is good. <laughs> Make a bulldog break his chain. That's good. All right, so we're going to put the lids on. Mm. My.